once upon a time in my travels in the vault, I found what is called a build reel. It's something that Frank worked on where he would take things and combine them and see how it sounded. And, and on one of these build reels, I found the song Funky Nothingness and it was labeled. And the album is made up of studio stuff that was recorded there. And it's also made up of some recordings that were made in the basement at the house. Even though the song Funky Nothingness doesn't come from the actual record plan sessions that the bulk of the record is from. And because it's a bluesy shuffle, it kind of sets the tone for this entire record. I just basically took the uh, idea from that build reel and I took that little track and I used it as the opening of the album because it really does, like I said, it really does set the tone for what you're about to hear. The record plant, um, it was a beautiful studio and he had a setup in the basement four channel quad setup and you guys recorded Chunga's Revenge and that basement jam where you play rhythm guitar on mm -hmm. in four channel at that time in 1970 and that was really ahead of its time. He puts things together in a very unusual way that most people would not but he sees the connection at some level. To me this was the most normal thing I'd ever heard. It was absolutely normal for Ray Collins to be playing with dolls in humor. It was absolutely normal to have a piece by, a little snatch of a piece by Verez next to my boyfriend's back. It wasn't crazy. It was just normal, but it was a different sort of normal. Well, you know, fusion music is a genre that everybody talks about these days, you know, but back in 1970, it was a brand new sound. It's electrified improvisation, basically. And Frank was really using that at this time. And so this record kind of shows off a lot of that. In addition to that kind of format, there's the bass line. He doesn't hear a bass line as anybody might play. He hears a composition down on the bass line. But the bass line is extremely important in terms of how it sounds and how it feels. Yes, and that's what separated him from the rest of the type of bands that were doing that kind of music at that time. You know, Ian was talking about the Garrett Theater. There wasn't anything happening like that at that time. Frank was incorporating theatrics with music. Obviously, people like Alice Cooper took it to another level. It became beyond the beyond. But what Frank was doing in New York City in 1967 in a small little theater was the first of its kind. And musically speaking, that's that's true. Frank was combining uh, musical influences uh, for the first time. Nobody was doing what he was doing as far as the combination of musical influences. Something jazzy here, something from the R&B world, something from modern classical, and just throwing it all together and turning it into something so unique. And if anybody does that nowadays, they'll instantly get classified as, oh, that sounds like Frank Zappa. So <laughs> he really did create his own genre. And it's wonderful. I'm 100% sure Frank never did it to be wacky, but he did it to be interesting. He always said that everything is connected in the audio world. Any kind of noise, it doesn't have to be what we would think of as music. Anything is up for use. And that's how Frank's mind work. And that is what I loved about that. At this point in Frank's career, he had done so much musically with the mothers. That was what Ian had described. Unbelievably unique combinations that created these compositions, right? This time around, there seemed to be a lot of extended improvisation, which is kind of led to the jazz formula, which is just one chord or maybe a couple chords and just just extended soloing, a lot of extended soloing, and a lot of the songs on Funky Nothingness are vehicles for this approach. But there are some songs that have a written type composition going on, like Twinkle Tits is one of them, but there's covers of old R&B songs that Frank loved so much because he was taking advantage of the fact that he had Sugarcane Harris in the band with him, and Sugarcane comes from the doo-wop world and the in the 50s and that was what Frank was listening to when he was young and so the love of R&B is is very apparent on this album and now we get to hear it for the first time it's crazy that this stuff sat in the vault for 52 years or something like that it's just it's 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 great i gradually have come to think of Frank as an opera composer actually because all the songs that he did aren't songs like we normally think of them 
They're stories and they have characters in them. They're sort of mini operas is what they are. And I experience them with the depth that I would experience, let's say, um, um, a Mozart opera. Frank is really in that world of, you know, the, the sort of more universal world of what it is to be alive and to have feelings and how how they this can be expressed and should be expressed so that other people can understand how Frank feels about it. Ian, it's so good to see you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us about your history with Frank. You were such a part of so much with, uh, with this. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you, Joe, very much. And <laughs> I've always looked forward to playing again with you. <laughs> <laughs>